Welcome everybody to Los Santos, very much so the Grand Theft Auto equivalent to Los Angeles, home to the wealthy elite and movie stars of Vinewood, and of course those living on an altogether different side of the tracks. In today's video I wish to explore a murder that occurred among the precious few of the Grand Theft Auto universe's film industry, and though I'm certain at this point it's been done to death by many creators before me, it's just good fun. So join me as we ponder over an important question. One Grand Theft Auto V allows those observant enough to answer. And that question is of course, who killed Leonora Johnson? Like any good mystery, this one begins on the good old internet. Not the real one, the GTA one. On which there is a website named Who Killed Leonora Johnson? in which a fictional man divulges just how obsessed he is with this case, whilst also giving us all the facts in one place. With the landing page of course giving us this synopsis, if you will. On January 17th, 1975, the dismembered mutilated body of young Vinewood starlet Leonora Johnson was discovered by the side of the Landak Dam, following an anonymous tip-off to the LSPD. Her killer was never found. It became the great unsolved murder of the 20th century and an unhealthy obsession of mine for my entire adult life. I don't know what first drew me to Leonora. Something about that auburn hair, those green eyes, the sad smile, the photos of her skinny dipping that her uncle sold to the Los Santos Meteor the day after her death. A jaded detective in an episode of The Science of Crime once told his stereotypically cocksure younger partner, know the victim and you will find the killer and I've sacrificed 30 years, two marriages, and a promising career as a photocopier salesman to knowing Leonora in every way imaginable. Some that I'm not proud of, but I will uncover the truth. Why were the police so slow to react? Why was the case closed so quickly? Why did the murderer disfigure the body in such a horrific and deliberate way? Where was my consultant credit on the movie adaptation? I know they use this site for research. Still today, there are so many more questions than answers. My beautiful, vulnerable Leonora, I won't let you down like all the others. I won't forget, how can I? My basement is wallpapered with pictures of you, one of the reasons I lost the photocopying job. I won't stop until justice is served. The mental state of the author aside, this overview gives us a good idea as to what's actually happened. A rising star decades back was murdered brutally, and her murder was never solved. As for this site, it presents itself as if it's there to serve justice, but it mentions just enough to plant that seed of doubt that makes you think it's meant to sensationalise the case, rather than get justice for the victim. Nonetheless, it will be a useful tool in giving us all the information we need. So let's dive into who this Leonora Johnson actually is. Or should I say was? Fortunately, the website does have a biography for her that's slightly inappropriate on the author's front that reads as follows. Leonora Johnson was born on August 29th, 1952 in the Midwest. Her father Harold worked as a plucker at the local chicken farm, her mother Eileen as a slopper at the local dairy farm, so it's safe to assume that her expectations for life were set fairly low a sloppy plucker or some other rural thing. A sickly child, she suffered chest problems for many years, mostly as a result of the heavy smoking so in vogue at the time. Leonora was a quiet, unremarkable student whom one of her teachers described as the kind of early physical developer and late mental developer that got a lot of attention from older boys and certain faculty members. At the encouragement of her uncle, or possibly to get away from him, Leonora left school at 15 and hitched her way to Los Santos with dreams of becoming a movie star or model. After working as a waitress for a few months, it didn't take long for Leonora's childlike naivete and stunning good looks to catch the eye of wolfish entertainment industry types, and she soon became a common face on the Vinewood party circuit and the casting couch circuit. By the early 1970s, she was getting regular work in print ads, television commercials, and minor movie roles. After a scene-stealing turn as a wise-cracking disabled prostitute in the 1973 film Rum Runner, the Los Santos Shepherd described her as a pretty face to watch without perhaps much spark in the eyes. And shortly before her death, she was allegedly a front-runner for the leading female role in The Many Wives of Alfredo Smith. Who knows how bright her future could have been if that pretty face hadn't been severed from her perfect body. 
and of course this biography page is accompanied by a couple of photographs of Leonora, presumably from around this time. A young star from the middle of nowhere with notably unremarkable intelligence, who dared brave flying the nest to seek fame and fortune, and was making progress in accomplishing those dreams, only for the scary reality of this world to come up with its own ideas. Which brings us to the website's What We Know segment. The murder did not happen at the scene. The body had been cleaned and posed like a gruesome piece of art. Lenora's head had been decapitated. Her face was missing features. Her hands and feet had been removed, apparently while still alive, and she was posed such that her feet were where her hands were supposed to be and vice versa. Furthermore, part of her left thigh had been severed and positioned next to the body, with the word ham written on it. A star had been drawn on her back in cigar burns, her breasts had multiple incisions, and reporters had arrived at the scene hours before the police did, trampling over all the usable forensic evidence. We also know the autopsy stated Leonora was a redhead with blonde pubic hair, neither of which were natural, standing at 5 feet and 4 inches in height, weighing 110 pounds with green eyes. We know sensational press coverage attracted intense public attention to the case, with a few lunatics confessing to the crime just to get their picture in the papers, and perhaps most terrifying of all, we know the killer taunted the victim's family for years with letters, phone calls and horrifying souvenirs, including Leonora's locket and most famously on the anniversary of the murder, her severed lips. And that paints a particularly twisted picture of the individual no doubt responsible for the murder of Leonora. And along with it we also get photographs of her body, giving us a good idea as to the extent of the depravity exercised against her. But of course, the question is why? Obviously there's some element of ritual involved, but where that begins and ends and what form it takes furthermore, is not for us to know. The killer clearly took their time with this one, amputating Leonora's hands and feet while she was still alive, and then sometime after her death, she was placed somewhere she would inevitably be discovered at Landak Dam. It's clear there was an element of sadism at play as the killer constantly contacted Leonora's family, sending letters, mailing mementos, making phone calls. If you get away with murder, what's the point in taunting the family of your victim? It just increases the risk of you being caught. The simplest answer is the only possible reward one could get out of taking such a risk. Gratification. And if Leonora's remains are anything to go by, I'd say we're certainly dealing with a disturbed individual. But who could that possibly be? Well, before we actually answer that question, the Who Killed Leonora Johnson website gives us various suspects. And though some proposed suspects here make more sense than others, it's a good starting point for this next bit. There's Mitch Dexter, an actor who had a brief, possibly consensual fling with Leonora during the spring of 1969, with the possible motive being an interview in which Leonora spoke about a high-profile Vinewood celebrity taking advantage of her before her 17th birthday. For some reason her dad's a suspect, but I doubt he was posting his own daughter's body parts to himself. That would just be absurdly elaborate. There's Everett Rogan, a casino worker and ex-boyfriend of Leonora's from 1972, who was supposedly extremely jealous of Leonora's rich and famous male company, and though their relationship only seems to have lasted two months, he appears to have become obsessed. Then there's Johnny Sutton, a janitor slash caretaker in Leonora's apartment building. Considering his childlike mental state, the authorities actually tried to pin the murder on him. And though he did confess over 20 times, he was doing so in exchange for lollipops, and probably didn't even know what he was confessing to. Therefore, his confession was both manipulated and unreliable. Then there's David Richards, the patriarch of the Richards' majestic movie dynasty a company that owns a complex of snazzy movie studios, which is incidentally where I stole this shit box from. Though Richards has no clear motive, there were rumours of corruption, evidence tampering and blackmail surrounding the Leonora Johnson case, and if that were true there's only a handful of people who would have the sway, wealth and connections to thwart a murder investigation so effectively. We also know Leonora appeared in a number of Richards' majestic productions, and David Richards sent money to Leonora Johnson's family in March of 1975, following the murder. As for the new information concerning his knowledge of a confession letter, we'll come to that in a moment. 
Another suspect is David Richard's son Solomon, who had a falling out with Eleonora, and if he were the killer it would explain why David Richards might be involved in a possible cover-up. But a public spat in an industry as cutthroat as movie making, pun partially intended I suppose, doesn't necessarily immediately make somebody a murderer, and when it does you'd expect it to be a tad more spontaneous than this case appears to be. Anyway, for now the next suspect is Carly Ferran, Leonora's transgender roommate and the person last seen with her before her death. LSPD reports suggest the anonymous call tipping them off about the location of Leonora's body came from a woman with a deep voice. The best motive the author of this site could come up with is that Carly Ferran wanted to be Leonora. Then we've got fellow actress Betsy O'Neill, who was a big star in the 50s and 60s, with a flimsier motive than the last one. Jessica Barlow's an interesting case however, she was supposedly Leonora's best friend at high school, though her parents have no recollection of her. She capitalised massively off her death in the press, portraying her in a 1980s pornographic reimagining of her murder. I think it's fair to assume that Jessica Barlow didn't know who Leonora was at high school, and the claim was likely made to get an in on fame. As for portraying Leonora in a pornographic reimagining of her murder, well, even in a world where Rule 34 is taking anabolic steroids, I don't think anybody had the foresight to anticipate that one. And then there's Jeff Campion, the author of the website who has an obsession with the murder of Leonora Johnson, to the point where in the eyes of the authorities he became a suspect himself. I have no clue why he included that on his own website, but he did. And finally we have Peter Dreyfus. In one of Leonora's last letters home, she mentioned that a big time director had promised her a leading role in a movie, which is widely rumoured to be The Many Wives of Alfredo Smith, although Dreyfus has never confirmed nor denied this. Some have also made the rather tenuous link between his frequent belittling of actors as harlequins and the bizarre way in which the body was posed, like a pantomime jester. A heavy drug user in the 1970s with a twisted mind and an obsession with the macabre as art. It's certainly the Harlequin link that gets me. As far as suspects go, he's one of the more interesting ones, but we'll park that for now. Now most of these suspects are just noise, they have no link to the case whatsoever, and their bios, as short as they are, give no real indication. Even the more interesting people of interest don't really have anything terribly damning in those bios, save for one piece of information, or more accurately, one rumour. The rumour that David Richards, the patriarch of the Richards majestic movie dynasty, had knowledge of a confession letter regarding Leonora's death. On the landing page, this bit of information receives this update. Big breakthrough, confession letter confirmed. In a recent interview, Ira Richards, son of the movie maker Solomon Richards, claimed he remembers his grandfather David Richards in a drunken stupor one time ranting about a confession that had to be torn up and hidden throughout Los Santos in the late 1970s as insurance to protect those who knew too much. Now, that is interesting. At the very least, it indicates that David Richards might know the killer's true identity. But unfortunately, we can't just simply ask him because, well, he's dead. Since 1975, the brutal murder and dismemberment of starlet Leonora Johnson has remained unsolved and captivated conspiracy theorists. Now, there may be a breakthrough. Ira Richards, vice president of marketing at Richards Majestic and grandson of movie mogul David Richards, told a reporter that his grandfather claimed to have destroyed a confession letter in the weeks before his death. Mr. Richards Sr. passed away last year at the age of 103. His son, Solomon Richards, has run the family studio since 1978 and told reporters he knew nothing beyond the fact his son was a moron and his father was delusional. Solomon Richards dismissing his father as delusional over this when he himself is a suspect is certainly on the suspect's side, but if there is a torn up confession letter scattered across Los Santos, then maybe the actual answer lies in picking up the pieces. Well, fortunately that's a thing we can do. There are 50 scraps in total however, which in my opinion is a bit of a rigmarole. Now I could give you a comprehensive guide to all of the locations, but we would simply be here until the cows came home. However, since this game is over a decade old, there are guides simply all over the internet 
if you wish to find all 50 of them. And if you wish to pause this video 50 to 100 times, you can get all the locations from the footage that's on screen now. But do be warned, it's the absolute final boss of all faths as you sent around in circles across the entirety of the world map. And the only one that's tricky is the one in the maze, because mazes suck. If you've not done it before, all I can say is expect the most tedious, dull, collectible hunt of your entire life. Which may quite possibly be a slight exaggeration, I understand that, but it isn't exactly the most gripping gameplay you'll ever be involved with. But if this is something you want to do in Grand Theft Auto V, I suppose you've got to get stuck in. I promise time will start flying after you've lost a sense of reality. So after what felt like an utter eternity of simply collecting scraps, I finally had all 50 pieces ready to be pieced together to uncover the identity of Leonora Johnson's killer once and for all. And though collecting all these pieces was certainly a massive hassle, the satisfaction of now being able to piece together this mystery makes it all worthwhile. So once you've gathered all 50 of the scraps of this confession letter, we can of course read it. It is printed on a Dreyfus Productions piece of paper and reads, March 15th, 1975. My dear David, listen, I know you're a little offended by the discovery of my little indiscretion, as the French would say. I translated that because I can't be asked. But I want you to understand, that's all it is, a little indiscretion. I agree wholeheartedly with you, my actions were a little inhumane, but that's not a bad thing. Inhumanity is the very watchword, the very currency, the very lifeblood of the artist. My inhumanity makes me human. It's thanks to my inhumanity that I'm able to speak to people with the moral authority of the sinner and the creator, all at once. I had to kill her, and I had to do it in that way. The way that would hurt me most, by torturing her slowly and painfully, then sending mementos from our date to her family. And in the years since, I've had to, at times, goad her family into further suffering, just to prove how very much I understand suffering, and how I can represent it best as an artist. Isn't it better that one family suffers so the world can be free to enjoy, to learn and be cleansed by my masterpieces? Don't even bother answering that. The answer is obvious, and if you get it wrong, well, then you're less of a man than I thought. But let's not concern ourselves with such trivialities. We are artists, my friend, the last of a dying breed. I dread the day when you finally retire and Solomon takes over. Sure, I love the kid, but he's a remorseless hack with none of your passion, your creative zeal. He's a weak, livid moralizer hiding in the body of a vinewood decadent. He understands nothing about why we act as we do. Not because we can, but because we must. And that's the thing. Some people take advantage of their position in this town for pleasure, as if sleeping with multiple young girls or torturing hitchhikers or eating dogs could ever be fun. It's awful. I only do it to experience it so my art is truer, deeper, more meaningful. And I believe you know that. I cannot wait for you to read my new draft of Leard. I have really removed the cliches that ruined Shakespeare's plays and found the power, the moment, the thing we talked about that wonderful night in Mexico when we paid the hookers to stab each other. Anyway, I hope you and Rachel have worked through your problems. I look forward to making Friday supper again soon. You've always been an inspiration to me. Your dear friend, Dreyfus. Peter Dreyfus, the twisted director whose work focuses so much on suffering, murdered Leonora to inflict it upon her family so he could study and understand it without doing so the hard way. And sure enough, if you check out the synopses and reviews of films of his on classic Vinewood, the brutal topics of death, loss, senseless killing and torture crop up as themes an awful lot. He may have wished to explore the macabre, but his obsession led him to commit an unforgivable atrocity. And now with his own blood, the time has come for him to bear the cost of his sin. For a side mission is now available in which Franklin specifically can exact vigilante justice. Hey, you Peter Dreyfus? I said, are you Peter Dreyfus? Who are you? You want an autograph? No offense, but I'm not reading any screenplays. Huh? I mean, you're from the hood, right? You don't want to pick up the guns, because, like, if you pick up the guns, everybody dies. It's tragedy. 
pathos, tedium, and bored. Unless, you know, you're here to copulate. I'm here to what? People, they want to consume me. They always have. To touch the hem, you know, so to speak. And who's to hold that against them? I don't. Well, what time is it? I got a few minutes before my colonic, you know, if you want to suck me off. I wouldn't mind. Motherfucker, do I look like I'm here to suck you off? I don't know what you're here for, chum. You're like some barely credible deus ex machina sent here by random chance in order to challenge my impending divinity. Man, I don't know what the fuck you just said, but guess what? I'm here for this, chum. What's this about? Do you know her? Security? What's her name? Security, this guy's trying to rape me! Leonore Johnson. That's not what you think. The one who passed you fucked over after you killed her just because you could. How much you want? How much money you want? I got enough motherfucking money, homie. I'm famous. Fuck you! I can do whatever I want. Those are the rules, civilian! Get away from me! I'm an honor. And now we're tasked with either chasing Dreyfus down and making him answer for his crimes or simply letting him run. As he chases him, he gives away that he believes he's above the petty laws of the masses. Whilst also trying desperately to convince you that he's not responsible for Leonora's death. Whilst also admitting that he is. Just like that, justice has been served. With Dreyfus no longer wasting precious oxygen, I suppose we can give ourselves a pat on the back, right? But before I can sign off this video, I need to assign some commentary meaning to this fictional story. Firstly, Leonora Johnson's murder appears to be an easter egg, making reference to the Black Dahlia case, in which Elizabeth Short, a young woman from Boston, Massachusetts, of similar age to Leonora Johnson at the time of her murder in the Grand Theft Auto universe, was found dead and badly mutilated in Los Angeles, California, and to this day her murder has remained an unsolved mystery, though inspiration may have been drawn from other real-world murders as well. As for the message behind it, well, some people are willing to go to some serious extremes simply for the sake of art. Anything from my mangled sleep schedule, for instance, all the way up to torturing and murdering, and then tormenting your victim's family simply for the sake of inspiration. Furthermore, it's showing us that when these things happen, the human element goes amiss. The deceased becomes famous only for how they died, and that fame isn't always born from a desire for justice, but often rather the obsession with the mystery itself. The human psyche's infatuation with the morbid takes center stage and those unfortunate enough to lose their lives to imaginative killers who evade capture become little more than objects, bits of evidence to analyse, rather than human beings to remember. And regardless of whether or not that's the way it should be, and no matter how much we ponder the ethical implications of turning these horrific events into entertainment, we just can't help ourselves. Anyway, I suppose that brings us nicely to the end of today's video. Thank you all for watching, I really hope you've enjoyed it. 
If you did and you're new here, be sure to go ahead and hit the subscribe button. I'd really appreciate that, but that's up to you. And of course, be sure to leave a like if you did indeed enjoy. As for the comments, be sure to let me know which GTA Universe mysteries, secrets and lore you'd like me to explore next. Nothing's off the table. It's a long wait until Grand Theft Auto 6. Let's treat it as one. Anyway, with any luck, I'll be seeing you all very soon with another video at some point. But until next time, please take care and goodbye.